Robert Lee Frost, March 26, 1874, January 29, 1963. I had a lover's quarrel with the world. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Let's set the stage. We are in Ripton, Vermont, near Middlebury in the woods. This is the pathway between Robert Frost's cabin there and the home of Kay and Ted Morrison, his friends down that way. Now it's the middle of October and the leaves are almost half gone. And far away, the guns of war are being cocked. Like an old western, the boys are staring eyeball to eyeball, daring each other to yank their atomic weapons out of their holsters and fire. But we're sitting here in this quiet wood where a certain poet, Robert Frost, used to sit and walk during the last 25, 30 years of his life. And we're here instead of back there where all that threatening is going on because we like to try to achieve what Mr. Frost called a momentary stay against confusion. And we'd like to try to achieve that moment by looking at some of the things that he looked at and listening to what he wrote about those things. Now here's one, a poem. I'm going out to clean the pasture spring. I'll only stop to rake the leaves away and wait to watch the water clear, I may. I shan't be gone long, you come too. I'm going out to fetch the little calf that's standing by the mother. It's so young, it totters when she licks it with her tongue. I shan't be gone long, you come too. Time, the quick passage of time. Well, in the case of a storm or a lover's quarrel, the quick passage of time can be beneficial. But in the case of old age, or an impending war, the quick passage of time could be threatening. And in the case of autumn leaves, 
We ask time to let them fall slow, slow. Oh, hushed October morning mild, thy leaves have ripened to the fall. Tomorrow's wind, if it be wild, should waste them all. The crows above the forest call, and tomorrow they may form and go. Oh, hushed October morning mild, Begin the hours of this day slow. Make the day seem to us less brief. Hearts not averse to being beguiled. Beguile us in the way you know. Release one leaf at break of day. At noon, release another leaf. One from our trees. One far away. Retard the sun with gentle mist. Enchant the land with amethyst. Slow, slow. For the grape's sake, if they were all, whose leaves already are burnt with frost, whose clustered fruit must else be lost for the grape's sake along the wall. Forgive, O oh Lord, my little jokes on thee, and I'll forgive thy great big one on me. Now here we have the most famous place that Frost ever lived. And during the years that he lived here, the 25, 30 years he lived here, he had two final struggles. One he won and one he lost. And the one he lost was against death at the age of 88. And the one he won was, although he was an old, old man, and was written off as having nothing more to say as a poet, he came back in his 70s and 80s and wrote some of his finest poems. Let's go inside. Now here is the little room that uh, Robert Frost worked in so many years while he lived here. Very famous room, very few people were invited here, and those that were considered it a privilege. It was his sanctorum and, and the place that he created in. And he could look out those windows and see the trees and see a large part of the countryside. Robert Frost bought this noble farm, it's called the Homer Noble Farm, for several reasons. First of all, he liked Vermont, and he enjoyed the Breadloaf Writers' Conference. And they still have these conferences here, near here, but mostly he liked it here because of a great woman, Kay Morrison. She and her husband, Ted, moved into here, moved into a farmhouse near here, about 200 yards from here up the way. So Frost could visit there, visit their farmhouse and go there for meals. And Kay was his helper and his friend and his savior, really. She knew him for, I think, 50 years. And he would ring when he wanted to come there. He would ring an old phone, one of these kind that you turn, and in the next room there, and he'd ring that phone and say that he was coming down for meals and about three minutes later he'd uh, show up there and she'd feed him and she'd type his poems any of the poems that he wanted to type and then she'd keep away strangers she was a great friend i guess that poets and priests make up the most respected professions in the world and the least well paid the employment rate of a poet must be one half of one percent. 
and nobody's more unemployed than that. So why would anybody choose to be a poet? Maybe they don't choose it. Maybe it chooses them. I don't think we'll ever know much about poets, except that we do know that the first-rate ones are pretty complicated guys, ignited by a great many conflicts and a big share of torments and complications, volcanic procedures that go into an eruption called a poem. There's a, a calm, placid, well-adjusted mind does not seem to be able to write Dante's Inferno or to write this one. I have been one acquainted with the night. I have walked out in rain and back in rain. I have outwalked the furthest city lights. I have looked down the saddest city lane. I have passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes, unwilling to explain. I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet when far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street. And not to call me back or say goodbye, and further still at an unearthly height one luminary clock against the sky proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been one acquainted with the night. One of Frost's dozens of biographers said, whatever you think about Frost, you will find he is the opposite. And another one said, when you get around to agreeing with Frost, he won't agree with you. And another one said, he doesn't maintain a balance, he keeps getting one, and so on and so forth. But the only thing that they all agreed on, they agreed that Frost believed that there were no simple answers, and he didn't expect any help from heaven or any place else on that score. He believed we were all on our own, very much on our own. And in his play, The Mask of Reason, God says to Job, the discipline that man needed most was to learn submission to unreason. Snow falling and night falling fast, oh fast. In a field I looked into going past, and the ground almost covered smooth in snow, but a few weeds and stubble showing last. The woods around it have it, it is theirs. All animals are smothered in their lairs. I am too absent-spirited to count. The loneliness includes me unawares. And lonely as it is, that loneliness will be more lonely ere it will be less. A blanket whiteness of benighted snow with no expression, nothing to express. They cannot scare me with their empty spaces between stars on stars where no human race is. I have it in me so much nearer home to scare myself with my own desert places. When I see birches bend to left and right across the lines of straighter, darker trees, I like to think some boy's been swinging them. But swinging doesn't bend them down to stay as ice storms do. Often you must have seen them loaded with ice a sunny winter morning 
after rain. They click upon themselves as the breeze rises and turn many colored as the stir cracks and crazes their enamel. And soon the sun's warmth makes them shed crystal shells, shattering and avalanching on the snow crust. Such heaps of broken glass to sweep away, you'd think the inner dome of heaven had fallen. So was I once myself, a swinger of birches. And so I dream of going back to be. It's when I'm weary of considerations and life is too much like a pathless wood where your face burns and tickles with the cobwebs broken across it and one eye is weeping from a twig's having lashed it open. I'd like to get away from Earth a while and then come back to it and begin over. May no fate willfully misunderstand me and half grant what I wish and snatch me away not to return. Earth's the right place for love. I don't know where it's likely to go better. I'd like to go by climbing a birch tree and climb black branches up a snow white trunk toward heaven till the tree could bear no more but dipped its top and set me down again. That would be good, both going and coming back. One could do worse than be a swinger of birches. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen groundswell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone on a stone. But they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean. No one has seen them made or heard them made. But at spring mending time, we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill and on a day, we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go. To each the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves, and some so nearly balls we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side, it comes to little more. There where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here, there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd like to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. 
something there is that doesn't love a wall that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there, bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone savage arm. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only and the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so well. He says again, good fences make good neighbors. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. And then took the other just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as far as that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. We were talking about Frost play, the mask of reason. And when God won't give Job any good reason for Job's suffering, Job says to God, all right, don't tell me then. If you don't want to, I don't want to know. We don't know where we are or who we are. We don't know one another. We don't know you. We don't know what time it is. We don't know, do we? Who says we don't? Who got up these misgivings? Oh, we know well enough to go ahead with. Now here, is a poem along that vein that Frost wrote about walking on leaves just this time of year. I have been treading on leaves all day until I am autumn tired. God knows all the color and form of leaves I have trodden on and mired. Perhaps I have put forth too much strength and been too fierce from fear. I have safely trodden underfoot the leaves of another year. All summer long they were overhead, more lifted up than I, to come to their final place in earth they had to pass me by. All summer long, I thought I heard them threatening under their breath. 
And when they came, it seemed with a will to carry me with them to death. They spoke to the fugitive in my heart as if it were leaf to leaf. They tapped at my eyelids and touched my lips with an invitation to grief. But it was no reason I had to go because they had to go. Now up my knee to keep on top of another year of snow. My long two-pointed ladders sticking through a tree toward heaven still. And there's a barrel that I didn't fill beside it. And there may be two or three apples that I didn't pick upon some bough. But I am done with apple picking now. Essence of winter sleep is on the night. The scent of apples. I am drowsing off. I cannot rub the strangeness from my sight. I got from looking through a pane of glass I skimmed this morning from the drinking trough and held against the world of hoary grass. It melted, and I let it fall and break. But I was well upon my way to sleep before it fell. And I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. Magnified apples appear and disappear, stem end and blossom end, and every fleck of russet showing clear. My instep arch not only keeps the ache, it keeps the pressure of a ladder round. I feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend, and I keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load on load of apples coming in. For I have had too much of apple picking. I'm overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. There were 10,000, thousand fruit to touch, cherish in hand, lift down, and not let fall. For all that struck the earth no matter if not bruised or spiked with stubble, went surely to the cider apple heap as of no worth. One can see what will trouble this sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is. Were he not gone, the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep, as I describe its coming on, or just some human sleep. At the end of the row, I stepped on the toe of an unemployed hoe. It rose in a fence and struck me a blow in the seat of my sense. It wasn't a blame, but I called it a name. And I must say, it dealt me a blow that I felt like malice prepense. You may call me a fool, but was there a rule the weapon should be turned into a tool? And what do we see? The first tool I step on turned into a weapon. The way a crow shook down on me, the dust of snow from a hemlock tree has given me heart, a change of mood, and saved some part of a day I had rude. Now that's 
one of the lighter ones. He published only a few poems in that vein, but he wrote a great many of them. And here's a couple of others. And I may return, if dissatisfied, with what I learned from having died. And the last poem in Frost's last book reads, I see for nature no defeat in one tree's overthrow, or for myself in my retreat for yet another blow. But those lighter poems were between wars. Wars of his soul, I mean to say. The other wars, between nations, he didn't pay much attention to. He never got involved in any of the wars, even the Second World War. He kept apart from them, tried to disregard them as much as possible. In his poetry, too, and in his conversations. Now, he wrote a few letters about the four or five international wars that he lived through. He wrote about them sorrowfully and disdainfully. But right or wrong, he stayed outside of them. It earned him a great many enemies, particularly in World War II, the so-called justified wars. The only war that, that Frost was concerned with was what he called a lover's quarrel with the world. This war was primal, it was unending, and it was personal. It took place deep down inside of him. And deep down inside him is where he had to reach to write those poems. He pulled out all the stops for, what, nine decades. That's just under 100 years. And he never stopped until the day he died. And during his life, he became all kinds of different people, I tell you. You hear the stories. He was wicked, he was saintly, he was jealous, he was angelic, he was spiteful, he was enchanting, he was hateful, he was beguiling, cantankerous, and so forth. I think he needed every one of those qualities to write the way he did. He supped with God, and he breakfasted with the devil. And beleaguered and defiant, he wrote what he felt about the world. And what he wrote gave him, as Job says in Frost's play, Job says, to God, I've got enough to go ahead with. Now, perhaps the afterglow of what Frost wrote can help us too. Give us, like it gave him, a momentary stay against confusion.